I'm honored to be with you all here today. Thank you so much for this invitation. Uh, it's an honor to join you here in the Alsan Institute and to follow in the footsteps of such distinguished uh, visitors as you've had here in the past. Um, and it's important to be here to discuss uh, U.S. foreign policy at the, towards Asia, in particular during this critical time in, for the region and, and for the world and for my country. So this week I've been at the conclusion tomorrow of a, a week long of travel in the region and I wanted to share with you some of my initial reflections on the many great signs of growth and success I've seen across Asia this week, including those that have spread from the democratic ideals like those so well developed right here in the, public, in the Republic of Korea. But equally important, I want to have a conversation with you about how the United States can strengthen its alliances in the region and help spread those ideals of freedom and respect for human rights to all corners of Asia. I stand before you here, here today 25 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, and the end of the Cold War that followed. 1989 marked the, the so-called Year of Miracles in Europe. And as the Berlin Wall was torn down and the Iron Curtain that divided a continent was lifted, it freed millions of people from communist rule. All this just occurred just a few years after South Korea had made its full transition to democracy. At that time, many policymakers thought that communist rule here on the Korean Peninsula would, would soon fall as well. In 1989, we also witnessed the Tiananmen Massacre, which marked both a setback in the spread of freedom and, in hindsight, indicated the resilience of authoritarianism in Asia. Despite this, many believed that over time the Chinese government would realize the true path to prosperity, including real opportunity for its citizens, would occur only in tandem with meaningful democratic reforms. Now, decades later, we're still waiting for liberty in both China and in its close ally, North Korea, even as those two countries have taken different paths economically. In fact, in Asia, we are faced with the paradox that half of the world's population, half of the world's population lives in Asian countries that are deemed not free, while at the same time, more people live under liberal democratic rule in Asia than in any single region in the world. That said, significant work remains ahead if we hoped for freedom to fully eclipse authoritarianism and totalitarian rule in this vital region. Our first priority must be effectively dealing with the challenge of North Korea's ongoing provocations and its aggression. Indeed, this should be the shared priority of all people around the world who value peace and liberty and human rights. Sadly, decades of attempts to deal with this rogue and murderous regime have failed to prove fruitful. Diplomatic attempts by the United Nations and our allies to improve relations with the North have not been met with reciprocal actions. Instead, what we've seen is the North develop its nuclear capabilities and its missile programs, proliferate sensitive technology to rogue regimes, take unacceptable military actions against South Korea, seize American hostages, and deepen the repression of its own people. Some of you here today may have family members living in the North. I can't help but think of the experiences of so many of the people who came from the same place my parents came from, Cuba. Where I live from in Miami, Florida, there are so many people like me who are the sons and daughters of Cubans who came to the United States. Many others have themselves fled the repression and tyranny of the Castro regime. Most have family or friends that are still stuck there, still languishing under the iron fist of a dictatorship just miles away from where they themselves enjoy freedom. The American people, like the citizens of your country, they value and they treasure the status, their status as a free people. They understand that when human beings are denied their fundamental freedoms, they are not being given the opportunity to fulfill their God-given potential. They realize what it says about a regime when the elite are well-fed, but the people are left to starve in the streets. They understand that in 2014, it is reprehensible for hundreds of thousands of people to be imprisoned in gulags for no reason other than the, that the family they were born into or subject to the whim of one person. 
That's why we must continue to work towards the day when there is a unified Korean peninsula that will be prosperous and stable and most importantly democratic. And I believe and I personally pray that that day will happen soon and that will happen in our lifetimes. To this end we must be very careful that any diplomatic initiative with the North, as well as intentioned as they may seem, do not just encourage further provocations. We cannot continue to repeat the concessions and violated agreements of recent decades that have only led to more blustering and aggression. We must also ensure that any future engagement with the North be carefully coordinated with our allies in South Korea, who are the ones that must immediately deal with its consequences, whether they succeed or fail. Beyond North Korea, we are also faced with the increasingly important challenge of ensuring that China's growing economic and military power does not lead to conflict and instability, as has often been the case in the past when certain powers have risen. As I'm sure many of you here would agree, we need China to become a responsible stakeholder in the international system, one that contributes to the security of the global commons rather than simply benefiting from it as a one-way street. We do not seek to contain China, but rather to ensure that as it gains in military and economic power, its rise will be peaceful. We are encouraged by the opportunity to, to to deal with a China that's increasingly prosperous. As you do here in South Korea, we view it as an opportunity to have more people to sell to and trade with and interact with. And in Florida, we see more tourists. But by the same token, we must ensure that that rise is part of an overall aim to become a responsible regional actor and global player, adhering to established international norms that have made the prosperity and the miracles such as your own here in this country possible over the last 60 years. In sharp contrast, by the way, to the China system is Taiwan, which continues to show that traditional Chinese culture and democracy are not incompatible and can, in fact, thrive together. Now, we will not abandon our allies, including Taiwan, in order to improve or preserve our relationship with China. And the United States will not stand by quietly as the Chinese government seeks to exacerbate and exploit differences and disagreements between our partners in the region. In particular, China's recent unilateral announcement of an air defense identification zone over disputed territory with no international consultation or prior notification is emblematic of the concerns the United States and many in the region have about China's future trajectory. I would point out that in contrast, the way the Republic of Korea declared a zone several weeks later, it did so after consultation and in accordance with internationally recognized procedures. This is a living and vivid example of a responsible approach to these sorts of sensitive issues. This is an example to other nations in the region. And this, I hope, will serve as an example to an increasingly important China. Your example in this region leaves me convinced that we as democratic allies need to stand together to advance our interests and expand our network of like-minded democracies. So what would this involve? It starts with recognizing that the Asian region is vitally important to the future of American foreign policy, to my nation's security, and to our economic well-being. America must make sure that the rhetoric of the so-called rebalance to Asia meets reality and that our allies in the region do not feel that the United States has turned its back on them. America continues to have important work ahead in many other regions, particularly the Middle East. But our global commitments strengthen our place as Asia's indispensable power rather than detracts from it. The fact is that the United States has long been a Pacific nation and a Pacific power, and it is vital that we continue to maintain our robust military and diplomatic presence in the region while adapting that power to new realities, both here and elsewhere. To this end, we need to utilize all the elements 
of American national power, be they military, economic, or diplomatic, to make clear to all nations, friendly or otherwise, that U.S. policy towards Asia is more than just rhetoric. First, we need to continue increasing our military presence in Asia. And I applaud the attention and efforts that Secretary Hagel has recently made in this regard. By the way, yesterday I spent some time at the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, and had the chance to meet soldiers from my home state of Florida who are there on the edge of freedom, as they described it, to keep peace on the Korean Peninsula. I also met deployed Americans in Japan earlier this week, and in the Philippines I was able to witness firsthand the impact our men and women in uniform have had in the relief efforts after, after the typhoon. I got to see up close the truly vital work that all of our brave men and women in uniform are performing every day to ensure the, the sustainability of these security contributions in the region. American policymakers must find ways to ensure that our efforts to be fiscally responsible do not undermine our progress. To this, there is still much work to be done in this regard, uh, but I remain confident that our commitments in Asia can be adequately resourced. Economically, the U.S.-Korean relationship is a major success story. Given what it's achieved in the last 60 years, South Korea has become a model for others. I was commenting just yesterday on my ride to the DMZ how as a son of Cubans and living alongside so many in my community who have been exiled from their homeland, I look to South Korea as an example of what I hope one day Cuba will become, a nation that uses innovation and responsibly uses its resources, most importantly its people, a highly educated people, to craft for itself prosperity and a place on the global stage. We need more examples like this around the world, but it begins by invigorating the ones we already have, and your country is one of them. Your, your country's transition from a recipient of international assistance to one of the world's leading providers of aid to nations in need is a transformation that, that we are working together to achieve elsewhere in the world. Going forward over the next 60 years, we need to build on the success of the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement. And once the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, is concluded, find ways for other interested nations, such as South Korea, to join. This will allow us to further unite our economies on either side of the Pacific. In the name of creating commerce and business opportunities for millions throughout North America, South America, and Asia. Key to this, as you've seen uh, from the experience of the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement, is ensuring that there's bipartisan support for free trade in the United States Congress. We're also looking for decisive action from President Obama to close a deal on TPP and reclaim an international leadership position for our country on free trade and open trade. I've said before that I support trade promotion authority for the President and I hope to support the Trans-Pacific Partnership once it is concluded and the details are provided to the Congress. And I remain optimistic that there will be bipartisan support in the United States for both. I also believe we should look for ways to extend access to visas to the citizens of South Korea, to provide opportunities for those who wish to conduct business in America. I represent a state that benefits greatly from foreign tourists and business. I know that there's great interest in the Republic of Korea and in other close American allies to increase the allocation of visas for those who want to work and study in my country. And we should examine that as well. Also, as America's energy situation goes through a dramatic transformation, I think we need to closely examine, once our own indigenous needs are addressed, how America's energy boom can also benefit our close allies, including and especially those here in Asia. And finally, we need to ensure that our diplomatic efforts in the region match the steps we are taking in the security and economic spheres. And to that end, let me acknowledge that uh, I understand that there are deeply painful and sensitive issues that are being dealt with in this region between some of our partners. And I understand that the pain is truly unimaginable for those 
who didn't live through it or perhaps are not familiar with it. These are real challenges and we cannot ignore them. But by the same token, we also have a real challenge and that's the freedom and security and prosperity of this region and of this country in partnership with mine over the next 60 years and beyond. And in that end, the United States needs Japan and South Korea to work together. A closer bond between our treaty allies will immeasurably improve security in the region and enhance America's security as well. To aid cooperation and understanding between our allies, I hope that the United States will consider the so-called modifying the so-called hub and spoke model in which the United States is always at the center of the most important strategic interactions. And instead, I hope we can explore finding ways that our allies and partners can be further empowered to tackle these challenges jointly with the knowledge that the United States would still remain deeply committed to the security and the prosperity of the region. This means building and deepening the cooperation that you and that other U.S. partners have begun with emerging partners, such as India. It means establishing new avenues of cooperation in the defense, civil, and economic spheres between democracies in the region. It means taking a hard look at current regional institutions to see whether they are up to the challenge that we are facing in the decades to come, an emerging challenge, a multifaceted challenge, a challenge that seems to evolve every couple of years in a new direction. By the way, the, this is not always as easy as just moving more military assets into the region or capitalizing on the economic success of our partnership, but it's just as important as the other areas I've discussed. In closing, let me just say a few words about the state of the debate in my country, in the United States. As I've served on the East Asia Subcommittee on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee over the last few years, I've, uh, over the last year really, I've been encouraged by just how bipartisan our policy towards Asia has been. Nonetheless, it is true that there are many in the Congress and across my country that increasingly are skeptical about why America needs to remain so active in international affairs. Some wonder how events that happen halfway around the world have any impact on our lives. They're impacted by a decade of sustained conflict in the Middle East. And they're also impacted by the loss of life and the injuries that so many of our servicemen and women have suffered in those conflicts. Some ask why it matters how China develops or how it treats its people or neighbors as long as our trade and our commerce isn't impacted. Some even wonder why America should be bothered by a rogue regime like North Korea that seems incapable of providing for its own people, let alone taking on the United States. But I know that whatever our challenges at home, while these sentiments I've expressed to you are real and need to be addressed, most Americans understand in, their, understand in their hearts the price we pay when we step back from the world stage. We need only look to past instances when our country, when the United States has attempted to ignore threats and withdraw from the world. And the pain caused from those experiences have taught us an important lesson that foreign policy, and this is increasingly true, that foreign policy is domestic policy. When liberty is denied and economic desperation take root, takes root anywhere around the world, it ultimately affects us at home as well. It causes instability, which leads to economic threats and human rights abuses and security concerns that directly concern the interests of the American people. Just two days ago, I paid my respects at the American Cemetery in Manila where over 17,000 American service members from World War II were laid to rest. Just like the many Americans who gave their lives to help your country become what is now a stunning success. And just like those Americans who laid their lives down here, the Americans laid to rest in that cemetery traveled halfway around the world to pay the ultimate price for a cause greater than themselves. Similar prices have been paid by your own soldiers who have sacrificed to stand by America in our hour of need in far-flung corners of the globe 
and even by North Koreans who have risked all to bring about change in their own country. As a man who involved in smuggling videos of life in North Korea to the outside world recently told an interviewer, he said, quote, this is dangerous. And if I get caught, I know I'd be immediately executed as a traitor to the Korean people. But I've got to do this no matter what. I'm just one person. But even if I have to sacrifice my life, someday something is going to change. End quote. This is an example of the sort of bravery and selflessness that built our partnership as freedom-loving people. It is why I remain confident that freedom and liberty will continue to emerge in this region, even in its darkest corners. To support this, we will continue to work hand in hand with you and with our other allies in the region. Working together, the United States and the Republic of Korea have achieved great things over the last 60 years. And I believe that over the next 60, that our dest destinies remain intertwined. Together, we will continue to stand on the side of democratic government and free markets. Together, we will continue to stand on the side of peace and prosperity. Together, we will continue to stand on the side of those who demand freedom for all. In this first year of the next 60 years of our partnership, I am confident that we will continue this record of success. And I want to thank you for the time that you've given me here today. And I look forward to the conversation that will follow. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Rubio greatly uh, agreed to take some questions from the audiences. And we have a se sequential interpretation by Ms. Kim. Um, 질문을 받겠습니다. 여기 순차 통역이 준비되어 있습니다. 질문을 짧고 천천히 말씀해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. 마이크로폰 마이크가 준비되어 있습니다. Um, Paula Hancock's from CNN. We've seen an open letter from North Korea this morning um, effectively saying that they wanted to renew talks with, with South Korea, that they wanted to push for unity, um, also mentioning that they would like these, these joint military drills between the US and, and South Korea to, to stop. Um, now, obviously, this has happened in the past, but they seem to be uh, reaching out and may want to start talking again. Would you put any credibility on this, uh, on this suggestion they'd like to talk peace again? Senator, let's wait for the Yes, I'm sorry. 보도에 따르면요. 그 북한이 다시 한번 공개적으로 대화를 요청을 하면서 손을 내밀어 평화를 위해서 노력을 하겠다라고 하면서 남한과의 대화할 용의가 있다는 점을 강조했습니다. 그리고 한국과 미군 간의 그 연례적인 군사 훈련을 중단할 것을 주장을 했는데요. 물론 과거에도 이러한 제안이 북한에도 있었습니다만은 좀더 적극적으로 북한이 대화를 위해서 손을 내밀고 있는 것 같습니다. 이번에 이러한 북한의 제안에 대해서 이것을 믿을 만하다고 보시는지요? First of all, thank you for that. It gives me time to think about my answer. <laughs> um, I would say two things. The first is, so certainly when, when you get a message like that, you're hopeful uh, that, that it, it is meaningful. The problem here is there's a history behind this. This is not a recent uh, emergence uh, of, a, of a problem with North Korea. This is a long-standing one, and it is a pattern of behavior. It involves a, similar, a cycle that's now become far too familiar. The cycle begins with some level of provocation, followed by an expression of a willingness to talk, followed by more provocation, followed by another uh, expression of some willingness to, to ease international attention. Uh, meanwhile, there are potentially hundreds of thousands of people living in camps where they're being starved to death. Meanwhile, the other day they roll out an American who's literally being held hostage. Meanwhile, they continue to conduct their own exercises uh, which threaten the security of the South and of the world. So ultimately, as there's an expression in America, the talk is cheap. Um, we, we're hopeful that this is a true intention, but it needs to be followed up by something that begins to create confidence, both on the part of the South, but also on the part of the whole world, that they're serious about changing the destiny of their country and the direction that they're headed with. And ultimately, in order to gain the confidence of the world, that there's not just another in a series of steps in this uh, ongoing 
um, cycle of provocations, there has to be steps that increase confidence that this is more than just that. And so far, I've not seen that, and I don't, I'm not sure anyone has. So, uh, again, I think the fundamental, the, the problems with the North are deeply fundamental, and they go well beyond an open letter. I think there's steps they would have to take to ensure that uh, they're serious about changing their relationship with the rest of the world and, and with their fellow Koreans to the South. 네, 우선 통역을 통해서 제가 생각할 시간을 좀 주신 점에 대해서 대단히 감사드리고요. 제가 두 가지를 말씀드리도록 하겠습니다. 물론 그러한 그 유화적인 메시지를 받았을 때는 물론 이런 의도가 진정성이 있기를 희망을 하게 됩니다만 북한과 관련해서 문제는 과거에도 비슷한 사례가 계속해서 반복이 되었다는 것입니다. 이것은 굉장히 오래된 북한의 행동 패턴이라고 할 수가 있는데요. 이미 우리가 너무 잘 알고 있는 친숙한 패턴이 계속해서 이어져 왔습니다. 북한이 도발을 하게 되고 그 이후에 대화할 용의가 있다고 손을 내밀고 또 다시 도발을 하고 그런 다음에 그 후에 또 긴장을 좀 완화하는 그런 유화적인 조치를 취하는 이러한 과거의 사이클이 계속해서 지속이 되어 왔는데요. 북한 같은 경우에는 지금 북한 내에 수, 수십만 명의 사람들이 아직도 집단 수용소에 수용이 되고 있고 사람들이 굶주러 가고 있습니다. 그리고 미국인을 아직도 사실상 인질 상태로 잡고 있고요. 또 한국뿐만 아니라 전 세계 안보를 위협하는 군사 훈련도 북한에서 지속을 하고 있습니다. 그래서 북한이 이러한 의도를 내비쳤을 때 이런 의도의 진정성이 있 기를 바라지만 핵심은 이를 신뢰할 수 있는 신뢰성 신뢰를 쌓을 수 있는 그런 추가 후속적인 조치가 따라야 한다는 것입니다. 그래서 한국과 전 세계뿐만 아니라 이들과의 관계를 개선하고자 하는 의도가 굉장히 진지하다는 모습을 북한이 보여주어야 하고요. 그리고 북한이 이끌어갈 방향 앞으로 나갈 방향을 조금 변화할 것이다라는 모습들을 보여줘야 한다고 생각을 합니다. 그래서 전 세계에 신뢰를 얻을 수 있어야 한다고 생각을 하는데요. 이를 위해서는 단순히 이러한 지속적인 과거의 도발 그리고 유화적인 제스처 이런 패턴과 사이클을 지속을 할 것이 아니라 신뢰를 얻을 수 있는 그런 조치를 취해야 된다고 생각을 합니다. 하지만 저뿐만 아니라 여기 계신 어떤 분들도 그러한 모습을 아직까지는 보지 못한 것이 사실입니다. 그래서 북한과의 근본적인 문제는 단순히 이렇게 공개적으로 의도가 있다는 메시지를 보내는 것을 떠나서 정말로 진지하게 한국뿐만 아니라 전 세계와 관계 개선의 의지가 있다라는 점 이에 구체적인 조치를 보여줘 된다는 것이라고 봅니다. 네, 감사합니다. I didn't realize how much I talk. <웃음> 저 뒤에 강찬호 차장 중앙일보. 네, 중앙일보 선데이 매거진의 강찬호 부장입니다. 그 아까 한일 관계 중요성 언급하셨는데요. 박근혜 대통령은 일본이 과거사에 대한 잘못된 입장을 좀 명확히 바꾸는 그런 모습을 보일 때 이제 한일 정상회담이 가능하다는 입장입니다. 그 이런 입장에 대해서 어떻게 평가하시는지요? 어, 그것이 옳은지 아니면은 조금 일본이 아직 태도를 바꾸는 모습이 보이지 않더라도 한국이 전향적으로 전, 정상 한일 정상회담을 해야 된다고 생각하시는지 어, 입장을 밝혀 주시기 바랍니다. Hello, my name is Kang Chano. I'm from Chungang Ebo Sunday Magazine. You talked about the importance of the uh relationship between Tokyo and Seoul and President Park Geun-hye mentioned earlier that Japan needs to change its position and views on some histor history issues before there is an actual uh, summit between the two countries and what's your view on this position and also do you think that the Republic of Korea government should act first even before the Japan shows any signs of such actions changing their perspectives on the history? Well, thank you for that easy question. I, uh, <laughs> here, my comments on it are uh, as such. First of all, this is an incredibly delicate and painful issue, which I recognize. And uh, I do not believe it would be productive for American policymakers to um, tell countries uh, how they need to pursue their foreign policy. Here's what I can comment on. I can comment on the importance of our national security and the national interest of the United States uh, that uh, South Korea and Japan are able not just to speak to each other but are able to coordinate efforts. I can tell you how promising I think it would be for the region for that to be reestablished. And I can tell you that I acknowledge what a challenge it is with regards to the certain situation that's in place right now. And what I think the U.S. can continue to do is to continue to state the importance of, of that relationship being repaired and to encourage uh, the, both countries to figure a way forward because uh, the challenges and the opportunities of the future uh, 
mutually impact both countries and, and, and impact our alliance in a very significant way. So I think that uh, this is clearly an issue that we're interested in from the perspective of the United States' national interest. And uh, it is in our national interest that the relationship between uh, Korea and Japan be improved. How that's done, I think, will, unfortunately, will, 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 will be unfortunately an issue that I can't prescribe a solution for you today as an American policymaker, because I believe that it is largely a, a decision that needs to be made by the, the, the two countries engaged in this, uh, in, in this, conf in this uh, uh, uncomfortable situation and very delicate situation that we find ourselves in now. 네, 감사합니다. 우선 아, 제가 굉장히 이것이 민감하고 고통스러운 사안이 있다는 점을 충분히 인식을 하고 있습니다. 하지만 제가 미국의 정책 입안가로서 다른 나라의 외교 정치 외교 정책을 어떻게 해야 한다라고 이렇게 말씀을 드리기는 조금 생산적이지 않은 것이라고 생각을 합니다. 하지만 말씀드릴 수 있는 것은 미국의 국가 안보라든지 미국의 국가 이익에 있어서 한일 관계가 개선되는 것이 얼마나 중요한지 단순히 양국이 서로 대화를 하는 것이 아니라 양국이 서로 협력을 하고 계속해서 조율을 해 나가는 것이 얼마나 중요한지를 강조드리고 싶고요. 그리고 이러한 노력이 다시 재개됐을 때 미래가 얼마나 더 밝은지에 대해서 말씀을 드리고 싶습니다. 물론 여러 몇몇 지역에 관련돼서 지금 이와 관련돼서 양국 간에 아주 어려운 도전 과제가 있다는 점을 저는 충분히 인식을 하고 있습니다. 미국은 계속해서 양국의 관계를 회복하는 것이 중요하다라고 강조를 할 것이고요. 그리고 양국이 어떻게 하면 진전된 방향을 파악할 수 있을 것인지 논의를 하라고 계속 강조를 할 것입니다. 그리고 동시에 이렇게 만약 관계가 회복이 되게 된다면 물론 도전 과제도 있지만 큰 기회가 된다라는 것이고요. 이것이 단순히 양국뿐만 아니라 미국의 동맹 관계에 크게 영향을 미칠 수 있다는 점을 강조할 것입니다. 물론 미국의 입장에서는 많이 관심을 가지고 있는 분야이고 또 한일 관계라는 것이 미국의 국가 이익에도 직접적으로 연관이 되기 때문에 많은 관심을 가지고 있지만 이것을 어떻게 추진을 하고 개선을 할 것인가에 대해서는 다시 한번 강조드리지만 미국의 정책 입안자로서 제가 어떻게 해결책을 말씀드릴 수는 없을 것 같습니다. 그래서 결국은 이제 한일 양국이 어떻게 이것을 이 민감하고 좀 어려운 사안을 해결해 나가고 대화를 해나갈 것인가를 결정하는 것이 그 모, 양국의 몫이라고 생각합니다. 예, 감사합니다. 여기 아까 손 들은 어, 김지윤 박사. 마이크로폰. I'm Kim Ji Yun from the Asan Institute. Welcome to the Institute, Senator. Um, I actually have a question. I know you are uh, here to talk about foreign policies, but I actually have a question on domestic politics in the U.S. Um, I understand that there's some warning, worrying um, voices from the conservative side that there's a, a weak to strong uh, social conservatives uh, uh, in the, the Republican basis. And then, like, you know, Tea Party movement kind of exemplifies that. Um, I, as a beneficiary of Tea Party movement in 2010, also backlashed um, later, like in the last year, on immigration bill. I wonder uh, what do you think about that statement. And my second question is, it's kind of similar vein, that uh, more and more people are recognizing from the um, Republican Party that Hispanic population is getting more uh, important and also very important voting bloc. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons, just partly one of the reasons that you are considered to be the, the presidential hopeful for, for 2016. Um, but, you know, we, you are the Cuban-American, and as you well know, that the more than 70% of the Latino voting bloc is actually comprised of the, the Mexican origins and also uh, Puerto Rican origins, and they have pretty different party affiliation from the Cuban-Americans and also policy and uh, political positions on many issues and immigration bill is one of the case. So I wonder how you can reach out to those non-Cuban Americans and also bridge it with them. So that's me. 제가 두 가지 질문을 드리겠습니다. 미국의 그 외교 정책에 대해서 말씀을 하셨는데요. 미국 내에서 이제 여러 정책들을 제가 좀 말씀을 드리자면 티파티 운동에 대해서 또 말씀을 드리고요. 지금 저 최근에 공화당 내에서 조금 더 보수적인 그런 성향의 이런 티파티로 대표되는 운동이 있었습니다. 2010년에 처음 나왔지만 이제 이민법으로 인해서 약간의 어떤 그 문제도 있었는데요. 그 이러한 상황에 대해서 어떻게 생각을 하시는지 궁금하고요. 두 번째로는 이제 공화당 내부에서 아마 뿐만 아니라 전체적으로 이제 히스패닉계가 굉장히 그 
중요성, 유권자로서 중요성이 더욱더 가고 있는데 그렇기 때문에 이창원 의원께서 2016년에 있을 대선에서 자기 주요 이제 공화당의 대선 주자로 지금 인식되고 있지 않은가라는 생각이 듭니다. 쿠바계 미국인이시지만 사실 라틴오 인구의 60%가 멕시코나 푸에드리코 출신인 것이 사실인데요. 이들 같은 경우에는 쿠바계 미국인들과 뭐 이민법이라든지 다른 여러 가지 사안에 대해서 조금만 다른 입장이라든지 견해를 가지고 있는 것이 사실입니다. 이러한 상황에서 이들과의 관계를 맺기 위해서 특히 이제 큐바, 쿠바 출신이 아닌 이러한 그 라틴오 히스패닉 유권자들에게 어떻게 다가가실 계획이신지요? I first promised to come back here after 2016. <웃음> I was listening to see what the definition, how you translate tea party in Korean. I didn't hear the tea party. Yeah, we just say tea party. Oh, okay. I didn't hear. I, I caught Cuban and Latino, but I didn't catch tea party. So let me handle both of your questions, which are uh, issues that I deal with quite a bit uh, in, in domestically in the United States. As far as the best way to understand what's happening, in my view, in America today. is this pervasive sense of economic insecurity. We used to have jobs where even if you just graduated high school or perhaps even if you didn't finish your education, you could still find a job that paid a livable wage and raise your family. My parents were able to do that as immigrants that had no formal schooling beyond the age of nine or 10. The nature of the economy has changed all over the world, but especially in the United States. Today, the jobs that pay enough money to live off require a higher level of education and skill than ever before. As a result, even Americans that are currently living in the middle class feel insecure. They feel as if they are one bad break away from losing everything. And you do have a segment of our population that feels unable to improve their lives because the jobs aren't there for them. In that realm of insecurity, there is a strong school of thought of which I am a part of, which has largely been attributed to the Tea Party movement as well. that the federal government is spending too much money, taking on too much national debt, and has put in place too many rules and regulations and impediments to job creation and business growth. And that is the sentiment beyond the Tea Party. To the extent that there is a debate within the Republican Party about that, it is about tactics. What is the, what is the right way to pursue this agenda we agree on, and which I believe is a majority position in American politics? And so the debate you often hear about from the United States among conservatives, among Republicans, even among those who are members of the Tea Party movement is not necessarily what we believe, but rather a debate about what is the right way to put those beliefs into action. Uh, what are the right legislative tactics? What are the right political tactics? Your second question is related to the first, and it has to do with Hispanic American voters and their trends in terms of registration and voting. I've never viewed it that way. I've never viewed that we somehow need to go out and find a set of ideas that have special appeal to Hispanics or Asian Americans or some group and cater to people in that realm. Here's how I view it. And I view it this way as a first generation son of immigrants who have still surrounded by people who are struggling to improve their lives. The reason why people come to the United States, the reason why my parents came to the United States is because they wanted a better life. and they wanted their kids to have a life even better than their own. My parents wanted every dream and every ambition that I had to be possible because they were not possible for them. This is the prevailing sentiment in America, but it's especially prevalent among immigrant communities, Hispanic Americans included. And so the future of their allegiances politically will depend on which political movement, which political parties, and which candidates not just understand that feeling, but have ideas about how to improve their chances of achieving that. Whoever can show people that they have a better agenda for providing them a better life and an even better life for their children, I believe will secure the support of not just Hispanic Americans, but the majority of Americans as well. 네, 우선은 그두 가지 질문을 하셨는데요. 다시 말씀을 드리겠습니다. 이 질문 같은 경우는 제가 중내, 국내 정치를 하면서 종종 다루고 있는 그런 문제이기 때문에 말씀을 드리자면요. 첫 번째로 이제 미국에서 지금 일어나고 있는 여러 가지 상황을 가장 잘 이해할 수 있는 방법이 바로 경제적인 불안정성이 크고 커지고 있다는 라 한마디로 요약이 될수 있을 것 같습니다. 예전에는 미국인들이 고등학교만 나와도 심지어는 이제 정규 교육을 마치지 않아도 그래도 가족을 부양할 수 있는 일자리 같은 것은 충분히 가질 수가 있었는데 그래서 
그 저희 부모님도 그랬고요. 저희 부모님 같은 경우에는 이제 아홉 살, 열살 이후로 제대로 된 교육을 받지 못하셨지만 미국에 오셔서 일을 가지고 이제 가족들 생계를 꾸려 나갈 수 있었습니다. 하지만 근본적으로 경제의 어떤 성격이 바뀌어야 바뀌었다고 할까요? 전 세계에서 일어나는 트, 현상이고 특히나 미국에서 이것이 더욱 더 심화되었습니다. 그래서 오늘날에는 충분히 가족을 먹여 살릴 만한 그런 일자리를 갖기 위해서 그런 직업을 갖기 위해서는 고등교육이 필요하고요. 그리고 어떤 능력과 기술을 갖춰야 하는 것이 필수적입니다. 이러한 상황에서 미국 내 중산, 중산층도 점점 불안감을 느끼고 있는 것이 사실이고요. 한순간 자기들이 가진 모든 것을 잊을 수, 잃을 수도 있겠구나라는 불안감에 사로잡혀 있습니다. 그렇기 때문에 아, 일자리가 없기 때문에 내 삶이 더 이상 나아지지 않겠구나라는 어떤 자괴감에 빠지게 되는 것이 문제입니다. 그래서 이러한 상황에서 저도 또 포함된 이런 여러 운동 특히 이제 티파티도 여기에 이 부분이 있습니다만 많은 사람들이 가지게 된 것이 연방정부가 너무나 많은 재정적인 지출을 하고 있고 너무나 많은 규제를 하고 있고 또 너무 많은 지출이 있기 때문에 결과적으로 일자리 창출과 비즈니스 그 기업들의 성장이 저해받고 있다라고 보는 시각들이 있게 되었습니다. 이러한 그 상황에서 저희 그 국내에서 정치권 내부에서는 구체적으로 이런 상황을 어떻게 개선을 할 것인가 조금 전, 전술적인 그런 방법에 논의가 초점이 맞춰져 있는데요. 이것이 대다수의 정치인들이 가지고 있는 생각입니다. 공화당 내부나 보수적인 성향을 가진 사람 그리고 티파티 내부에서도 단순히 우리 신념에 따라서 이것을 해야 된다. 그 신념 자체가 중요한 것이 아니라 이것을 실현하고 있는 자신들이 믿고 있는 것을 실현할 수 있는 구체적인 그런 방법에 대해서 더 많은 관심을 가지고 있고 이것을 실현할 수 있는 구체적인 정치적 또 경제적인 방안이 무엇인가에 더 많은 초점을 맞추고 있다고 말씀을 드리겠습니다. 두 번째로 질문에 대한 답을 드리면요. 제가 생각할 때 어떤 그 저의 의견은 특정 아시아계 뭐 이민자라든지 아니면 히스패닉계에게 어필할 수 있는 그런 생각이라든지 그러한 어 정책들을 찾아 나서야 된다라고 생각을 해본 적이 없습니다. 특히 이민 1세대로서 이민자의 아들로서 어 저희 부모님께서 미국에 오신 가장 큰 이유는 더 나은 삶을 찾아서 특히 자신들이 누렸던 삶보다 자손들에게는 더 나은 삶을 살수 있도록 하는 기회를 주기 위해서 미국으로 이민을 오게 됐는데요. 자기들이 불가능했기 때문에 이룰 수 없는 그런 꿈들을 자식들은 꼭 이룰 수 있도록 하기 위해서 미국행을 택한 것입니다. 그래서 전반적으로 미국에서 가장 많이 어, 많은 사람들이 하고 있는 그런 생각들은 뭐 어떤 히스패닉을 포함해서 어떤 이민자 그런 커뮤니티도 마찬가지겠습니다만 어, 아마 그 미래 좀더잘살수 있는 기회를 만들어주는 그런 미래가 중요하다라고 볼 겁니다. 그래서 어떠한 신념을 가지고 있다라는 그 자체가 아니라 이것을 이뤄내 낼수 있는 그런 정당이나 그런 후보들이 아마 지지를 받을 수 있으리라고 생각을 하고요. 즉 자기들이 더 나은 삶을 살수 있도록 그것을 가능하게 해주는 사람들이 아마 지지를 뭐, 뭐 히스패닉이든 그런 거 상관없이 유권자들의 폭넓은 지지를 받을 수 있으리라 생각합니다. 예, 아, 참 유관스럽게도 그 상원 의원께서 다음 스케줄이 아, 잡혀있기 때문에 아, 질문을 받지 못하고 클로징 리마크를 간단히 듣는 걸로 행사를 마무리해야 되겠습니다. Instead of taking another question, since you have busy schedule, why don't you make a closing remark? Well, thank you for that opportunity. To, first, I want, again, thank you so much for this invitation and the chance to speak to you. The purpose of this trip for me, as much as anything else, was to be able to get back home and encourage more of my fellow American policymakers to begin to think strategically about the challenges that we face in this region. Uh, I fear too often times uh, these issues are analyzed in simplistic ways and sometimes we ascribe to them notions of the world that are no longer applicable. Uh, ideas that once mattered 20, 25 years ago but uh, perhaps no longer apply. And I would just uh, close by saying uh, three points I want to make. The, the first is I, I believe this, despite the challenges that exist in this region, the opportunities are even more exciting. And the opportunities are very real. The world, I think, is flatter than it's ever been. The ability of people to buy, sell, and trade, invest in one another is higher than it's ever been. The ability of students to travel abroad and study is higher than it's ever been. The ability to innovate, both in partnership and in competition, is better than it's ever been. I was commenting this morning that I read that after years of being told that they needed to make their screens bigger, Apple has now decided to make their screens bigger on the iPhone. Well, I don't, they didn't arrive at that by themselves. They arrived at that because of competition. 
because there's another product in the market that you may have heard of, which has com been created real competition. And they're responding to competition. And these are the sorts of positive things that exist when you can trade. But trade is built on the second point, and that is security. Look at the prosperity of this region. Look at the millions of people who just two decades ago, not just in this country, but throughout the world lived in deep poverty and despair, who now live in the middle class and whose children have the opportunity to live an even better life. That's an extraordinary achievement, but one that would have been impossible without the stability of our regional security cooperation, without freedom of the seas, without inter established international norms, and without the military power to back them up. And we cannot walk away from what we've achieved in that regard because it undermines everything else we've achieved. And my last point is, I was struck yesterday as I visited the border with the North and the DMZ, that what, we, what I visited yesterday wasn't just a geographic border. It was the literal divide between freedom and oppression. It was the divide between democracy and totalitarianism. It was the divide between opportunity economically and a stifling economy. It's a graphic example that I, before I came, I showed my pictures, the iconic picture of Google Earth that has a map of the peninsula. To the south is a well-lit country, symbolic of the light of freedom and opportunity. And to the north, there's darkness, symbolic of what is denied to human beings, not just in the north, but in too many places around the world. What we've achieved over the last 60 years together and what you've achieved in this country particularly over the last 20 and 30, is nothing short than an economic and political miracle. And you have to continue to build upon that. We have to continue to build on that. Because it doesn't just matter to people on this peninsula. It matters to nations that aspire to the same thing themselves all over the world. That's what's at stake here. I want my children to inherit a world that looks better than the one they live in now. And I want all of our children to inherit a world where Asia looks more like South Korea and a lot less like the North. And you can certainly help us achieve that, and we can achieve that together by continuing our important alliance. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you here today.